Hello and welcome to our Harley Street, one way to Harley Street CPD snippets. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, we are running a number of uh, lunchtime seminars, keeping them short to 20 minutes, using only 12 slides with the aim that we will talk about a single topic, hopefully with some interest to all of you and try to make them entertaining as well. Um, please do send us your feedback and if you have any recommendations for future topics, we'd like to know. And in each slide, uh, in each talk, uh, we will present you with one or two slides, which are the key slides. These are the messages we'd like to, to really uh, get across. Uh, I'm a consultant colorectal surgeon and uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, paranormal sinus. This is the part two of the paranormal sinus talk. And uh, before I start, I want to answer a question from a previous uh, talk that was, uh, arose from a previous talk. And that was uh, when I was discussing the treatment of the paranormal sinus with the cleft lift procedure. The question is, does the cleft lift procedure uh, can be used in a primary abscess stage or only for a secondary uh, treatment? Uh, and the, answer, the short answer is it is used as a definitive secondary procedure once the abscess is drained and the infection is resolved. And you can do that either as a local anesthetic quick procedure or under general anesthetic if necessary. However, the procedure is effective and can be used and is used for those cases where there's a chronic slow discharging abscess with granulation tissue. Uh, and these are not the acute abscesses which are parallel with the patient presenting with severe pain and temperature. So I hope that explains that. So today, part two, um, we've discussed uh, the management in, in part one. I talked to you about uh, treatment of paranoidal sinus and we talked about the etiology and I discussed uh, the management of uh, surgical management with non-symmetric, non-midline closing techniques such as flaps or off-center closures or what I consider the best option, the so-called cleft lift procedure, leaving wounds away from the midline, not operating in the midline and not leaving big holes. However, as I also explained, unfortunately, a vast majority of patients are treated by large wounds, wide excisions, leaving the wound open, or uh, primary midline closures under quite a lot of tension, which leaves very big holes. And this is a serious colorectal headache. And this is a simple, this is a similar, this is a sort of a case in example. Patients sent to me is about, at least about 16, 17 years ago when I first uh, got appointed uh, by a colleague who had done an initial primary operation to remove paranoid sinus. And as you can see, there's a lot of tissue been removed, quite a big hole left behind. And as expected, these, these spaces get filled up with a hematoma and then an infection and they break down. And there's a suture material left behind and parallel necrotic debris and a great big deep cavity right down to the sacrum on the cock. And these are a real headache. Um, why they happen? Well, incomplete excision really results in a recurrence, usually not a big wound. It's probably, as, we, as I mentioned before, a poor technique. And uh, the techniques that result in this are the wide excision methods, uh, laying open methods. And if you try and close these wounds by a simple primary midline closure, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of movement, the grinding of the buttocks, and these wounds do get filled up, which is a big space there full of uh, seroma and hematoma, and they get infected and fall apart. Once they get dehiscence, then you got this big subcutaneous cavity. And, and there, there's a real uh, uh, significant morbidity associated with this. These are young individuals who have to make multiple hospital visits or community uh, uh, centers, uh, nursing uh, centers, uh, other GP practices and district nurses, tissue viability. Uh, and these, these guys really are losing time from work. Uh, there's significant impact on the quality of life and their psychological well-being, as in this particular study uh, in the BMJ about 12 years ago. So um, what are the options then? Well, we can offer them surgery again, and uh, this is a viable option. <clears throat> and unfortunately, as I mentioned previously, in the UK and Europe, unlike America, uh, we are still offering these patients another re-excision. Um, debriding the wound, cutting a bit more out, leaving a bigger hole, expecting a different outcome, which uh, I seem to remember is the definition of insanity. So uh, re-excision is really not a good idea. 
Uh, flap reconstruction is a good idea, as we discussed, and any procedure that results in flattening of the natal cleft uh, makes the wound away from the midline will work, but these are significant surgical procedures in individuals who've had multiple operations, and they're not that keen on them necessarily. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, the best option, which is the cleft lift uh, procedure, which is a tertiary uh, a referral type procedure, as not many uh, people seem to be yet uh, uh, okay with this technique. However, many patients are fed up of surgery and only got a hole this size, even the cleft lift and any flaps are quite a challenge. So what you're left with is simple dressings, and that is what the actual uh, likely scenario is for these patients. They end up having uh, lots of dressings done, and it really doesn't matter what you put in there. You can put Aquacel, Aquacel Silver, uh, Caltostat, simple gore-soaked in betadine or gore-soaked in uh, heavy scrub or whatever you like. Um, people put Manuka honey for some bizarre reason because it has a high osmotic uh, uh, pressure and can kill off bacteria. But the, the fact is, it, in the right environment, the wound will heal. The problem with it, this is not the right environment. It's a deep cleft between buttock cheeks, lots of movement, and you've got a bone at the base of this. So they don't heal well, as we've seen. Uh, Average of about three months for these wounds to heal, average, and uh, young individuals who are really quite fed up of it. And uh, negative pressure wound therapy, VAC dressings. We touched upon this last uh, during the last presentation. Uh, studies have shown these to be uh, completely ineffective. Uh, the only Cochrane analysis of two, meta, uh, two uh, randomized trials showed that they were effective for uh, only about four or five days uh, reduction in the healing time from something like median of 90 to 95 days to around 85 to 90 days. So really, uh, to have a young adult walking around with one of these things attached to their tail end day and night uh, for three months is uh, laughable. Not many, uh, there are not going to be many takers on this, uh, especially given it's not effective. So, um, but there is hope in the horizon, and that's what I want you to uh, I want to talk to you about. And topical 10% metronidazole ointment sounds very simple, but it's extraordinarily effective. Uh, as any good discoveries in medicine, there was there was at least a significant hint of a, a chance and accident with this. Um, and uh, this is an ointment. Uh, metronidazole is an imidazole antibiotic, as we all know. It's an anaerobic antibiotic, but it has significant anti-inflammatory and as yet ununderstood uh, immunomodulatory effect. And it is a first-line treatment in Crohn's disease, which is where we are looking at its effect. We were uh, uh, we ran a trial, a multi-center between uh, St. Mark's Hospital in London, myself at St. Thomas's and Cardiff in Wales, uh, where we're looking at the effect of this on perianal Crohn's disease some 12, 14 years ago. Uh, Metronidazole is highly effective in treatment of Crohn's disease on oral doses. So we thought, why don't we use it in perianal disease by applying it to these open vistula post-operative wounds that weren't healing. Um, and whilst the effects uh, weren't as encouraging as we wanted to be in Crohn's disease, uh, we did notice, uh, and I certainly myself and a colleague in uh, USA at the same time, David Armstrong, had began to notice that Patients who had concurrent pyelonadal wounds, who had surgery and uh, in this big inflammatory phase of their Crohn's disease, had a massive big sacral wound, were showing significant and rapid healing of the sacral wounds uh, whilst the fistula was still festering on. So uh, we decided to have a look at this. And uh, uh, I had a bunch of these patients that I inherited, and I, one or two in our from our department, and a whole lot of tertiary referrals, and I prospect, prospectively looked at these uh, uh, for, for uh, the effect of this uh, metronidazole. Um, the ointment is simply applied to the dressing that you're going to put inside, and then dressing and ointment both together go into the wound. It's very simple. You carry out with your standard regime uh, of treatment. Um, it was a three or four year study period when we looked at these 20 patients, and uh, these are the demographics, as you can see, as you expect, uh, young males mostly, uh, but young individuals. Uh, seven from our local uh, hospital, St. Thomas's at the time, but also 13 from tertiary referrals. And uh, the, the, the things to concentrate are these, these, these two uh, columns in here, these, these boxes. Disease duration, these guys have got a parallel disease 
a median of one and a half years, between five months to nearly seven, eight years. And uh, their duration of indolent, where the wound's been open and hasn't healed, is a median of eight months. These guys are walking out holding hole in their uh, sacrum or on their pretracheal area for about eight months, which is discharging and draining. And there's one guy in there who's got six years in open wound, and I'll show his slides to you. Uh, and as you can see, multiple procedures, but majority were lay open, primary closures, but a few of them were flap reconstructions. As you can see, is, these don't add up to 20 because many procedures, each patient has had two procedures at least, up to nine procedures. Uh, so these are not your average paranoidal sinus uh, first timer. These are patients who have multiple operations, uh, recurrences, wounds that don't heal, then they go on up to have another operation, that fails. Uh, unfortunately, big preponderance of midline closures and lay open procedures. And we followed this up weekly. Uh, I had a nurse specialist at the time with me, my clinic, uh, who followed these patients up on two weekly basis, and he would come into the clinic and drag me across to have a look at their wounds when the patients were all ready to be examined. And we literally for complete epithelialization, a simple outcome. This is not a clever study. We literally want to see can we heal them. And we saw some dramatic results. Wounds were healing in about 90%. 18 of these patients healed in about four weeks. Some of these patients had had wounds for uh, six years. This is a chap who had had, as you can see from the scarring in here, he'd had something like three or four operations elsewhere. One of them was done by me in my hospital, and I'd been left with a wound that wasn't healing. So after four weeks, of having this little hole, I'd managed to get him to heal as far as this. He ended up having this wound, which had not healed for something like uh, 12 months from the previous operation. So uh, this was quite dramatic. And uh, uh, we noticed that only at two of the patients had recurrences. One of them went on to heal with more cream and one of them I had to reoperate on. So it's quite encouraging result. And uh, here's another example of a 30 year old man who was sent to me uh, either north of England or Scotland, somewhere near Northumbria uh, or Scotland, I can't quite remember. But what I remember is his, uh, his mother, who's a nurse or a district nurse, called me to say, my son's had multiple operations. He now has his eight weeks post-op, having had what he was told was a keridakis flap procedure, which should be a, a midline procedure and should be very effective. But on day eight, his wound had broken down. And when he presented to me here, this was wound I measured about 18 to 20 centimeters. And you can see the wound enters his anus. Uh, the picture is not quite showing it, but literally the wound entered his anus uh, all the way. And it was a big open wound, a uh, big gape with lots of necrotic debris in it. This is after eight weeks of attempted granulation. So um, he was fed up. He didn't want to know. Want, he actually uh, thought he might have another operation by me, but I suggested, given it's so much contamination, let's just try the cream. And uh, he went back home with his mother doing dressings, um, and they were sending me pictures. So apologies for the quality of the photograph. These are all sent weekly photographs by his mother from her iPhone. And as you can see, as we go along week by week, we begin to see some epithelialization. The cavity begins to look clean now. And there's the same man with the same scar tissue at the top end. And this is on fourth week, we begin to see the wound epithelializing. On fifth week, it's beginning to close at the top end. Sorry about the quality of the photos. There's the same scar, same man. And there he goes at the final seventh or eighth week. So he took about seven or eight weeks to heal what was a wound that was uh, uh, about 20 odd centimeters after four operations. So uh, about the same time, David Armstrong, who's an English surgeon who works in Georgia, Atlanta, start, uh, wrote up his results and we were in correspondence and he showed his results of about 50 odd patients he'd looked at, there's the little table, and he had very similar 80%, 90% success rate in 50 patients over a period of 10 years he'd been looking at them. Um, and he wrote this up, I think, uh, a couple of, a few years back now. Um, and uh, uh, with minimal uh, recurrence and uh, any morbidity. So uh, suddenly we had uh, a candidate for treatment of a very difficult, complicated uh, condition, which uh, uh, does not involve surgery. 
very exciting and uh, we have started a multi-center trial now on this. It's running between Australia, who's a crew recruited already, but unfortunately due to the COVID pandemic, there's been some uh, uh, cessation of the trial. Uh, also in Turkey, the three centers in UK, unfortunately, are still uh, wait, waiting to start work due to the uh, stringent uh, MHRA regulatory um, processes here. And the US regulators, FDA, are also uh, taking their time. But uh, hopefully the trial will get going uh, sooner or later and we will see a, what is a randomized controlled study on this. However, this agent is available now and it, it can be prescribed. It's available on a number of uh, uh, pharmacies in uh, certainly in St. Thomas Hospital and uh, London Bridge Hospital on the uh, pharmacy they have them. It can be prescribed and uh, SLA Pharma UK will uh, send it out within two days to the hospital or wherever the prescription is filled. It's expensive because it's unlicensed. Uh, I think the current cost is around about £120 or so, it's expensive. Um, a few years back, when uh, we were seeing the results of the metronazole, I asked a colleague, Shirley Chan, who used to be my senior fellow at St. Thomas's, to uh, present, uh, to look at a uh, district hospital cost of uh, repeat polynatal surgery. And this was quite an interesting paper. Obviously, some of these are estimates from their uh, uh, economy department, economic uh, or a socio-economical sort of uh, studies are always slightly estimated. But uh, uh, they, they looked in a five-year period, 116 patients, and they estimated a, a cost of a consultation, an excision or a flap, uh, follow-up, one consultation perhaps, and they assume all goes well, and you're going to get 10 days of, of work, and each day, therefore, uh, to the economy, the cost of a young man staying out of work will be that. So they worked out about £11,000, the cost of a, you know, being off work for two weeks for a paranormal surgery. Now, if you account for the recurrences which they had in that period, so the total cost of 116 patients at 11,000 will be around about 1.3 million. If the recurrences were included in that, those who recurred, it would be a cost of another 300,000 to get these guys uh, if they all heal after a second procedure. However, the predicted saving if you use just the ointment for six weeks, on the assumption it will heal, uh, 120 pounds, a tube of ointment, you have a significant cost saving and of course, patients who are going back to work sooner and are not carrying these indolent wounds for months and months. So uh, it's probably also quite beneficial from that aspect. So uh, to finish off the talk, uh, key slide here. Um, best outcome is achieved by good surgery. First operation is always the best. But even recurrences, if they go to the right center by the enthusiastic specialist, an off-center cleft lift procedure or an appropriate flap will result in a good outcome. But non-healing wounds are unfortunately a reality. And they're a reality in UK and Europe, a re reality all over the world, because the uh, techniques of primary closure are not very well taught, not very well practiced, and the vast majority of surgical procedures are still the lay open procedure or the primary closure techniques in the midline. And they're left with this horrendous significant clinical problem. Indolent, long-standing, difficult to treat wounds, with significant uh, psychological and psych socio-economic impact on patients. These guys are typically fed up. They really don't want another operation. And um, uh, you know, it's, not, it's understandable. So uh, I would suggest we have a potential solution here. Uh, there is very little harm in trying it, even when the patients are waiting perhaps for an operation. Most of the time patients were referred to me to have an operation and they're waiting on the waiting list. And I said, why don't you try this ointment and we'll see how it goes. And a whole bunch of them ended up not having surgery. So once you've got an open wound and it's not healing with simple means, let's try the simple metronidal ointment as the first line. It does have a significantly high success rate and safe, but as many agents, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is just two people's observation studies. We now have data from Turkey again, open studies, but we don't have uh, of similar outcome, so 85, 90% healing rate, but we're awaiting the randomized data from Australia and hopefully uh, Europe and US. I hope this talk has been useful and I hope you'll join us 
for our next snippet in colorectal, which will be on rectal bleeding.